I first went to work for Barbara in 1968 when she was made the Albert Schweitzer professor at Columbia University and she never taught and so she needed a flunky. You need a research assistant, you need somebody to help you organize classes and so on. Barbara was the best public speaker of her time. She was brilliant. But she'd been used, and she was a good propagandist, but she'd been used to sort of giving the same speech 300 different ways. And you can't do that if you have the same students there every week. So I was drafted in to help organize a program and how we do the research and so on and so forth. And I was there when the the UN had originally decided to organize the, what became the Stockholm Conference in 1972 on the basis of a resolution from the Swedish government. And it progressed along, and it was clear that it was going to be a meeting of developed countries. The developing countries didn't see anything in this for them. They thought it was a threat, they didn't want to do anything. So the Secretary General at the time thought, ugh, we better get somebody to run this thing who people will pay attention to in the developing world. And so they persuaded Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada to release the head of the Canadian Aid Agency, Morris Strong, as the Secretary General. And Morris set out to try and find ways to make what looked like a rich man's agenda into something relevant to developing countries. And our part of the story is that he turned to Barbara, who was the only person he knew who wrote books that people in the developing world wrote, because she'd spent her life writing about it, to write a book about why developing countries should have a concern about the environment. So I was Barbara's research assistant, so I was drafted in. And I remember she came into my office one day and said, do you know anything about the environment? And I said, no. He said, we better figure out because Morris just asked me to write this book. So in sort of, I didn't, and the one thing about Barbara was she wrote everything herself. She was a professional writer. It says Barbara wore at the bottom of the page, she wrote, I didn't write it. I assembled stacks of books and notes and carried things down and read drafts and went up and down stairs. And so anyway, we eventually produced this thing called The Home of Man, which was a big bestseller in 1972. Uh, it sold in 25 languages and so on. And it did, along with a number of the other things that Strong did, it served to make development uh, and environment into a, not a dirty word, to try and persuade the sort of young, intellectual leadership of the developing world that environment wasn't just water pollution and air pollution, but it was soil erosion and loss of cropland and crappy drinking water and urban condition, the whole set of problems we now link between environment and development. Barbara basically defined all of those. And so after the conference, she was approached by the leaders of something called the International Institute for Environmental Affairs, which had been set up by an American oil man, Bob Anderson, uh, as a kind of think tank about international environmental issues. And he said, I'll do with this thing whatever Morris Strong wants, because we wanted to act as a support system. Morris, by this time, was ahead of UNEP. So Barbara said, yes, I'd been in the United States. She'd been in the US pretty much constantly since the war. And she said, well, it'd be nice to go back to Britain and we'll move it. Because there were quite a lot of these things in the US at the time. So I got, okay, I came along with the baggage. So I helped set it up and I put together the, the, the initial staff and the program. And I essentially ran it uh, under Barbara's direction, obviously, for, well, until I left in 1981. She almost all, she was almost constantly suffering from one form of cancer or another. Uh, and it was quite extraordinary to watch. Uh, she would never admit it publicly. She always had gastric flu or some other elaborate excuse, but it was cancer. And it was always a different kind. And uh, she went through all the, the various treatments. And it was, it, was a very, it was fascinating to watch because it was almost as if she willed it to go away. She had someone would get very angry and then it would recede. And obviously, Sloan Kettering and the King Edward VII and the hospitals all helped, but I, I convinced a certain amount of this was an act of will. But it was quite fascinating to work for, and particularly the Benny, because I'm a hick from Canada. Suddenly, here I am in Europe with this sophisticated woman who's called Lady Jackson and so on. And Barbara was one of those people who literally knew everybody because she had gone after, she had been the foreign editor of The Economist during the war.
she'd been used by the British government as a kind of acceptable face of Britain. Lord Halifax, who was the ambassador in the U.S., was a stuffy old fool and fit the classic British aristocrat portfolio. But Barbara was a beautiful young woman who was very funny. And so she was used, and she spent a lot of time in the United States and in other parts of the world, Sweden and other neutral countries, essentially just being Barbara, but essentially portraying an image of Britain as a progressive and interesting and a place that, that deserved support in the war. So she had this huge coterie of, of, of supporters. And she was married, or she eventually married, Robert Jackson, who was the head of the UN Refugee and Relief Administration, which was the whole rescue agency for Europe, partly under the Marshall Plan, and ended up living in New York. And she got befriended, or she befriended, or was adopted almost, by the New York Liberal Democratic Establishment, uh, largely Herbert Lehman, who became the head of UNRWA. And Herbert Lehman was the scion of the American banking community. So here's Barbara as the kind of first transatlantic person. It wasn't David Frost, it was Barbara. Equally acceptable both on both sides of the Atlantic and quite willing to do things for people without insisting on keep taking the credit. I mean, you know, you get nowadays you get people to do that and they ghost, ghost write stories for somebody. They say, oh, I wrote that, it was my idea. And Barbara never did it. And there are all kinds of strange stories told about her. I don't know how many of them are true. But she had, she was a socialist, she was a lifelong socialist, and she ran. Ernie Bevan's campaign in, 19, in, the, in the wartime election in 1945 in Lambeth South. And Ernie Bevan, who was the head of the TUC, later became the foreign secretary. And the story was told, I don't know whether this is true or not, that when George Marshall got up and gave the Harvard commencement speech, announcing what became known as the Marshall Plan, and he essentially said, you know, we're prepared to do this if Europe responds. Well, why on earth, not everybody, nobody in Europe knows what was going on, because why on earth would somebody announce something like this at a university? And Barbara, it was said, went to Bevan and said, Foreign Secretary, you have to, this is quite serious. You really, you know, if you don't do something about this, we'll lose the opportunity to get this substantial flow of funds from the United States to, uh, to Western Europe. Now, I have no idea whether that's an apocryphal story or not, but knowing Barbara could easily have been true, because she knew the players involved. And so you, she would quite often pull these rabbits out of a hat and you'd suddenly discover, I remember sitting when I was doing a report for the book, or the, some, uh, some research for the book, she came down and gave me a letter, a very complicated letter. She, I'd like to have your views on this and I looked at it. It was, it was basically theology, more or less. And I went back down and I said, well, I don't know, this all seems very persuasive to me, but um, I don't know anything about this. Who, who's this letter written to? He said, well, Pope. I said, what? She said, yes, I know the Pope quite well, which she did. And I said, well, you know, I'm just a kind of narrow-minded Presbyterian from the Northern Hemisphere. I don't know what you say to His Holiness, but it sounds persuasive to me. But she was a great friend of John XXIII. She was apparently the first woman to address a synod of bishops in the Catholic Church since 900 A.D., and she re helped run this thing called the Pontifical Commission on Justice and Peace, set up specifically by the Pope. So here she is, a very active lay person in the Catholic Church. She wasn't sanctimonious about it. She didn't seek to impose this on anybody. She would be rolling around in her grave if she heard me saying that I knew she'd written this letter to the Pope. But she was able to do things like this. And, and she knew, and I asked her about this once, and she said, you know, if you're ever going to do this, if you're going to ghostwrite things, or if you're going to try and influence important people, don't be standing around the front door saying, oh, I knew that, that was my idea, because that's the last time you'll be asked to help. So there's a long history of Barbara herself having direct influence on people like John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Harold Wilson, Robert McNamara, uh, the head of the IMF. She actually knew all these people personally, they paid attention to her because she actually had good ideas and because they were slightly afraid of her because she still wrote for The Economist, uh, but, but also because she didn't tell tales out of school. Uh, and I think that IIED, when it got going, had way more influence than anybody thought because if you did the normal kind of impact analysis that's very fashionable now with the aid agencies, you wouldn't catch any of this.
you wouldn't catch the fact that Barbara actually went and got the prime minister and said, yeah, I'll write it for you, writes a couple of paragraphs. Harold Wilson's memoirs, which must be the most boring book ever written, there's a section in it, and I swear this is true, in which he reports having been taken to the LBJ ranch when Johnson was president. This, this was notorious. Johnson got in the famous Lincoln with the, the longhorns on the front and drew, got drunk and drove them all around the ranch. And Wilson reports that they talked about this and they talked about Vietnam and they talked about security policy and so on. They came down to the last item, which was foreign aid. And Wilson got this piece of paper out of his pocket and started reading from it. And Johnson said, that looks like Barbara Ward's handwriting, and reached over and said, I've got the same one. And he, she'd written almost an identical letter to both of them and had structured the whole discussion. So it, it, she was quite remarkable in the way she did that. Uh, and, and people liked her because she was a delightful companion. She was a great dinner party conversationalist. She told very funny jokes about herself. She was extraordinarily well read, uh, and uh, and she knew how to use influence. Yeah, I, I once told, I asked her the sort of you know what did you do during the war, Lady J, and uh, and the various things came out. And essentially, she had she was a Catholic. Her mother was a Catholic, and her father was a Quaker. And Barbara really wanted to be an opera singer. She loved music, and she had a wonderful voice. And she wanted to go study music. And her father, who was a very practical Quaker, who also believed in girls' education, said, well, Barbara, I'm not sure you have the voice for it, but I'll make a deal with you. You go to Oxford and get a decent education. And if you still think you want to sing, then we'll send you to school and learn how to sing. But at least you'll have some skills. So off she went to Oxford. And she did it in, what, 1934, 1935. And he was well off. So she was finished off. So she was sent to Paris in the mid-30s uh, to learn French. And that was just at the time when the Bloc Populaire, the first socialist government, came to power in France. And then she was sent to Heidelberg, just at about the time that Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. And then she ended up in Rome when Mussolini was holding forth. So here she was. She could, you could see European history passing in front of her eyes. And she then came back, and she was hired by Arnold Toynbee, um, who was a professor at Oxford, and who was running a unit that monitored the press in, in Europe. And this was in the phony war. This was after the things that really started to die down after the invasion of Poland. And um, Toynbee got a phone call from the editor of The Economist, who was a man, but who was a, a paraplegic, so he was in a wheelchair, so he couldn't be drafted. And he essentially said, um, Arnold, I need some help because they've drafted all my staff, and uh, can you help me? And he, according to, me, according to Barbara, said, well, I've got this one young woman here on my staff who's supposed to be monitoring the Italian press, but her Italian is awful. Maybe she could be useful. So Barbara is shipped off to become one of the employees of The Economist. So she actually became, the, there were two women, essentially wrote much of The Economist during the war, Barbara and Nora Beloff. But she was also, the BBC had this classically arcane BBC show called The Brains Trust, which was apparently the, one of the most popular radio shows during the war. And it was two or three Oxford intellectuals and Barbara. And they were given, it was like a very high class clear quiz show. It was extremely popular. But Barbara was the hit because she kept making jokes and they were deadly serious. So she was kind of a media star as well. She was born in 1914. So she's, what, 25, at, well, or maybe 30 at this point, less, in her late 20s. And, and very beautiful. There's an Augustus John portrait of her, which is absolutely fabulous. So here, this very lively, intelligent, rather good-looking woman who kept giving these jobs. And after the war, she became the youngest governor of the BBC. And she was hired, um, she told this story, it was a wonderful story. She was hired to be one of the board of governors of the old Vic, and she couldn't understand why they'd hired her, and I don't know who it was that hired them. And she later discovered her principal first job was that she had to fire Laurence Olivier as the artistic director, because the rest of them couldn't stand him. So she had this, res in today's terms, she had this resume, which is long as your arm, and she's like 30 years old. Uh, so it, um, 
it, it didn't, I mean, it, it, I should say it set it up, set her up for life. That's not fair. What it meant was you had a person of sort of uncommon sophistication and influence at a time when women weren't supposed to be able to do this stuff. And I think what did her, did it to her as much as anything else, was she was sent by the economist to, try, to uh, cover the Nuremberg, Nuremberg war trials. And she watched the whole thing of Goering and the other Nazis all testifying and so on. And she said it was, she said, I'll never, never lose faith in democracy after that again. So that plus a Catholic faith made her a very strong person. Anyway, it was just a, um, it was great fun to work for because you had thrown into endless situations. And I remember being a graduate student in New York and she said, well, my husband is out of town and I'm giving this dinner party. Maybe you could sit in for him. And I said, well, fine. I was, okay. So I went and I sat there and greeted everybody and realized that I was sitting there with the head of the World Bank and the head of the IMF and Herbert Lehman of Lehman Brothers and Adlai Stevens. I was ridiculous. Um, but it, it, those were just the people she interacted with on a regular basis, and it makes you sound like a terrible name dropper. And Barbara wasn't, uh, she really wasn't at all, because she realized that by dropping all those names, you lose your influence. But it was just a very interesting exercise, and, uh, and she brought a lot to, to IID as well. She brought her contacts, she brought her ability to be able to write, she brought her ability to be able to influence people. And very, very good political, small p political judgment. Well, I think the really obvious influence is that, that Barbara was a genuine friend of the developing world. I mean, she devoted most of her life, after the, the sort of the end of the war, about, say, 48, 1949, she devoted her entire life to trying to persuade the developed countries to make a sensible interna international economic system, though, one that was fair to developing countries, one that was based on exchange of, of mutual respect, one that was based on some massive transfers of resources. So Barbara would always examine, a, even though she came from Britain and loved being in Britain, she would always examine a problem from the point of view of the developing countries. And it seems to me that's the sort of natural reaction of IIED. And Barbara would, I think, be very pleased with the discussion we've just had downstairs, which is, okay, we're going to see what we can do about reforming the world financial system. But it was largely about you know, how does it affect developing countries? How do you involve the G77, etc.? So I think although it's not always been particularly universally popular, IIED has, been, has remained very true to Barbara's ideals of um, the importance of the developing world, the critical importance of eliminating poverty and inequality, um, of engendering mutual cultural respect. I mean, what IID does now is essentially pure Barbara Ward. And I think the Institute's board and Camilla and the rest of you should be very proud of the fact that you've carried on absolutely the kind of legacy that, that Barbara would have liked you to do.